Whilst it's being drawn to a close, the GTE slash GT2 era has been a glorious period for the Grand Touring class of some of sports car racing's most prestigious championships and endurance racing's most iconic events. These machines have created some incredible moments in its history. Some of the best racing you'll ever see in any form of motorsport division, let alone sports cars, brilliant battles, and nearly always full of drama that keeps you hooked to the edge of your sofa, armchair, and to be honest, anything that you sit on, or even while standing up. What also made it brilliant was the amount of manufacturers that entered. Ferrari, Porsche, Dodge, Corvette, BMW, Ford, and Aston Martin, just to name a few. When you put some of the finest driving talent into them as well, it was perhaps a combination that was bound to work. This class of car has served the racing fan very well, and the new GT3 spec formula will have some way to go to try and live up to that. However, there is a manufacturer that is often forgotten about when it comes to the GT ranks. Jaguar, a name steeped in rich history in the world of endurance racing. The manufacturer has won an incredible seven overall Le Mans 24 hour races two Daytona 24 hours and one Sebring 12 hours, along with countless other victories across its time in sports car and endurance racing. It won in some fantastic cars such as the D-Type, the XJR9 and XJR12. This is not lost on racing fans, Jaguar is an automotive giant in the world of motorsport. So imagine the excitement and anticipation of these fans when an announcement was made on April 17, 2009 that Jaguar were going to enter the GT2 category, later GT class, of the American Le Mans series, and the 2010 24 Hours of Le Mans. With that class already being stacked full of fantastic manufacturers and privateer entries, the addition of a name like Jaguar was all the more glorious. The car would be built and run by RSR Racing. This team originated in 1985 by team owner Paul Gentilozzi, to compete in the Trans Am series, known then as Rocket Sports Racing, as it later turned out to compete in Trans Am very successfully. Paul is the wingingest driver in the category's history, with 31 victories and also collecting 5 drivers' championships. He's also won the 1994 Daytona 24 Hours overall, along with winning the GTS class of the 2002 Daytona 24 Hours in a Jaguar XKR. Meanwhile, it wasn't just sports car racing that the Rocket Sports team would make a name for itself. It would compete in the Champ Car Series from 2003 until the series' merger with the Indy Racing League. The team were competitive in Champ Car as well, even collecting a couple of wins. This team knew how to run a competitive racing program. In the press conference announcing Jaguar's return, Gentilozzi said, We haven't spent our time idly. We focused on engineering and construction of the Jaguar XKR. The luxury of time that we traditionally don't have in this process has been a great asset. Gentilozzi also said that he hoped that the work he did with the American Le Mans series and the ACO, the organisation that runs the World Endurance Championship in Le Mans 24 hours, would give them a car that was, number one, competitive on the track, number two, representative of Jaguar's racing history, and number three, economically viable for customers in the GT2 series around the world. Scott Atherton, the then CEO and president of the American Le Mans series said, Looking back over the decades, I believe Jaguar's finest hours in motorsport have occurred in sports car racing. The timing of its return couldn't be better. So like you've already heard, the car model that would set up the basis for the new GT2 Jaguar would be the XKR. This wasn't just a privateer effort with an ambitious and ambiguous dream, there was factory support behind this effort. The team were going to be entering into a technical and marketing partnership with Jaguar. The company would be providing engineering support and information to the team, with an engine development process also in the works. It was a factory-backed effort. Or was it? That's something I'm going to ponder on later in the video. So let's take a look at these statistics and figures. The car would have a front-engined 5-litre supercharged V8, which produced around 550 horsepower, which would be delivered to the rear wheels through a 6-speed sequential gearbox, with the car being able to reach a top speed of 180 miles an hour. At a weight of 1,245 kilograms or 2,745 pounds, 
The car was scheduled to debut during the 2009 American Le Mans series season, which it did so, completing laps at the 2009 Petit Le Mans, although not partaking in the race. However, its race debut would be at the following round of the season, which happened to be the final round at Laguna Seca. The team used the race as a learning experience. They weren't going to the race aiming to win or perhaps even necessarily run with the other GT2 cars. The crucial thing was logging as many laps as they could. It was all about testing for this team and building up that all-important mileage. The car would be driven by Paul Gentilozzi and Belgian sports car ace Mark Goosens, who would also be driving for the team in the full 2010 campaign. For Laguna, the XKR GT2 would start from the pit lane, and from that point the car made its first racing laps. Its speed was not really there, its fastest lap of the race was a 129.806. The lap time of the next slowest GT2, the Falcon Tires Porsche, was a 126.384. The time of the fastest GT2 lap by the number 3 Corvette was nearly 6 seconds faster than the Jaguar. However, that isn't the point. This was simply to gain extra data and learn about what the RSR Racing Squad had come up with as a basis. For the race at Laguna, they had as much as 4 hours to utilise. After around 90 minutes, the car would be one lap down to the GT2 leader. However, what also happened around 90 minutes into the race was the car's retirement. An issue with the drivetrain was seemingly the cause, with the mechanics moving the wheels that were meant to be powering the car forward. From their trip to the Laguna Seca circuit, they completed a total of 46 laps in the race. Again though, this shouldn't be a huge surprise. Brand new race cars, even in 2023, can struggle from teething issues, and testing is the best way to help diagnose this before you head into serious competition. The only difference being is that usually testing isn't in front of crowds of spectators, or their other competitors, or indeed the TV cameras and more than likely the several thousand people watching on the television. Testing during a race though does have its advantages, and the RSI racing team decided it was necessary. 2010 was the year where the most progress would be made. The endurance icon in the Sebring 12 hours would be up first. The team had also recruited Ryan Dial for the season. In qualifying, the Jaguar was 1.182 seconds slower than the next slowest GT2 car. In fact, it was closer to the fastest GTC Porsche than it was the next GT2 car. However, the car was, according to speed commentator Dorsey Schrader, spewing a lot of steam, and that was apparently after the car had blown its engine early in the weekend. The race though was about as bad as it could have been. Even if perhaps on pure pace they weren't going to do mightily well, then at least in 12 hours they could have a lot of testing time, especially considering the car had been updated from the one they ran at Laguna. Their race though lasted just 11 laps. The Jaguar was losing considerable amounts of fluid, in fact, cooling issues would be the reason the car was classified as a DNF, along with a blown head gasket. I mean, judging by these images, it's perhaps not hard to see why. Even with the low expectations set for this race, this was a horrific start to the season. I guess then the only way was up when it came to the next round in Long Beach. In qualifying, they were still over a second off the next lowest GT2. In a preview to the weekend, Ryan Dial said, I know we will take a huge step forward, and going into a slightly shorter race will benefit us. However, when it came to the race, they were pretty much invisible from a TV perspective. It was only until the race had a couple of minutes left that we got to see the Jaguar for any length of time. But that's a really good thing to see, or perhaps not see depending on how you think of it, because it means the Jaguar was very close to finishing the race, which it duly did. The XKR GT2 had finished its first race. So where did it finish? Well, it finished last of these still moving cars in the GT category. However, it wasn't classified because the car had completed 45 laps, 17 laps behind the Robertson Racing 4 GT. The reason why it was that many laps down? A sticky throttle, which in turn meant a portion of the throttle linkage had slipped, causing the throttle position sensor to read erroneously, reducing the power of the 5 litre AJ133 power plant, a problem that would continue to plague them until the checkered flag. Hence why the car's pace was not sprightly. Gentilozzi said, We won't be satisfied until we return Jaguar to its proper place in the field, at the front. We are going to keep working 
and we will get there. On to the next round, the familiar sights of Laguna Seca for a six hour race. Although before then the team conducted a test at Road Atlanta where the car apparently ran during the two day test nearly 500 fast, trouble free miles. The team also weren't the last car in qualifying, ending up a couple of tenths faster than the iconic crow racing colours of the Rizzi Competizione run Ferrari. However, they were still 1.631 seconds off the Robertson 4 GT again, in 10th. Goosens and Dial would pilot the car with Gentilosi withdrawing through illness. Whilst not run at amazing pace, the car was slightly closer in performance to its competitors and would run without issue until the time to spot Dial into the car came round. As Ryan tried to set off, it wouldn't. This time an alternator belt failure was the issue, with the team losing several laps, changing the battery. They would get the car to the finish, having completed 191 laps. The first signs of progress? Seeds of hope perhaps? Well they would certainly be hoping so because the biggest race of them all was up next, the 78th running of the Le Mans 24 hours. Once again though, the impression was that this was a huge test day, and that mileage was key. A quote from Goosen summed it up best for me, Everyone at Jaguar RSR is working really hard and we have one goal to put on the best show possible for all the Jaguar enthusiasts. It wasn't indicating that they were going to attempt to win the LMGT2 division, or that they were going to try and run as competitively as possible. They kept the expectations manageable. This was also Jaguar's 75th anniversary, so a lot rode on them at least keeping themselves honest. Plus, Jaguar were the most successful UK car manufacturer in the race. In practice though, they had clutch and electronic issues, but thought both had been fixed. In qualifying, they were last, and by quite a bit as well sadly. They were just under 2.4 seconds slower than the next slowest car, and a snippet under 13 seconds slower than the fastest LMGT2 lap set by the 64 Corvette. Dial said of the qualifying effort, I think that we are all happy to post a respectable time. However, the car was still suffering from problems. In terms of the race though, well, it went pretty badly, and that's me putting it mildly. The car completed four laps before retiring and being classified as a DNF. The issue seemed to be the electronics, specifically in the ignition, where the car would seemingly at random get a large spike in volts going through the electronic system, which set it into default, causing the engine to misfire massively. Or in the case of the race, causing the ECU, the electronic control unit, to stop working. It was later discovered that the reason it failed was that a data recording device, which was mandatory, was malfunctioning, which unfortunately for the team was something that the car or team had no control over. However, that wasn't known throughout the entire weekend, hence why the problem persisted and thus the early retirement. What a huge pity. So. It was back off to the US for the 4th American Le Mans series round, this time at the Miller Motorsports Park in Utah. Just under 2 seconds off the next slowest car in the GT class, the XKR then had its bonnet make a bid for freedom flying high into the air. Was this a case of poor build quality? No, the answer was that apparently there was a bottleneck in front of the Jaguar, with Ryan Dial apparently left nowhere to go other than hit the car directly in front of him. The car then suffered a misfire in the engine. Once the wiring harness and structural damage was repaired, the car returned to the race and managed to complete it, and collect a total of 57 laps back into the databanks to try and further improve the car. Lime Rock though was a real sign of encouragement. In qualifying they were under 4 seconds off the fastest GT class car, plus they ran without incurring any mechanical gremlins throughout the whole weekend. They were the innocent bystander in a collision which caused them to spin out. They also lost the wing mirror, which was mandatory so that had to be replaced. They finished the race 9th in class, and got points. Sadly there's no footage of the race at the next round in mid-Ohio, so you're currently watching the 2008 race in the background. It's a shame there's no footage because this was another slightly more encouraging sign for the car. The Jaguar was now under 2.5 seconds slower than the fastest GT time in qualifying, and in the race they also seemed to go free of mechanical issues although they did apparently collect a penalty for colliding with one of the GT Challenge Porsches, which may have helped in putting the car 5 laps down to the GT category winner. Road America was next, with the car 3.575 seconds off the fastest GT car in qualifying. 
again comparatively speaking an improvement in performance. However, the race would end just before the midway point after a clutch issue during the pit stop caused the clutch to slip and then grind the car to a halt, retiring from the race. At Mossport, the car was just under 2 seconds off the GT pole. However, after a spin with Gentilosi at the wheel in the early stages of the race, the car would end up 5 laps down to the GT leader in the truncated race. The final race, though, would round off the year for the RSR Racing Jaguar, the Petit Le Mans at Road Atlanta, the track where they had the nearly 500 fast trouble-free miles. So belief was a bit higher. In fact, a second Jaguar was entered for the race to join the 75 in the number 33 XKR GT2, driven by Andy Wallace, Tommy Dreesey and Butch Leitzinger. In qualifying, the 75 Jaguar was 3.009 seconds off the GT pole time. The 33 set a lap time of... Well, it actually didn't set a lap time in the session. In practice, the car had an oil leak, which, when the problem was diagnosed, led to the discovery of a crack in a new chassis component, meaning they wouldn't be able to set a time. When it came time to race, the 33 car retired with a cooling system leak causing overheating on lap 16, whilst for the 75 car it suffered a puncture, and then later in the race suffered a damaged water pump, which would lead it too to retire from the race. Rounding off an utterly miserable year for the team, Paul said in response to what the aspirations were for next year, There is no doubt in my mind that this crew is going to have these cars running strong and up in the front in 2011. I want to thank Jaguar for their support and desire to return the great Jaguar mark to the winner's circle, a goal I am sure we will accomplish in 2011. But did they? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's cut to the chase for how they would run the season. Instead of Yokohama ties, they'd be using Dunlops. However, Le Mans was not going to happen this year. Instead, another full-time campaign in the American Le Mans series, with two full-time entries, this time with wildly different driver lineups. The Sebring Car 98 had Rocky Moran Jr., PJ Jones, who had driven IMSA GTP cars in the 90s, and Kenny Wilden, a Canadian who demonstrated great ability in the series that nowadays is called the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge. Whilst for Car 99, it was a very tasty lineup all drivers who had great experience in the open wheel racing scene. Oriol Servia, Bruno Schenkera, and a very pleasant return for Cristiano De Mata, who after having had his racing career interrupted by an awful testing accident in the Champ Car Series in 2006, was making his racing return. Cristiano said, I've had a great career in open wheel cars, and I feel that it is now time to begin a new chapter in my life. In terms of qualifying for the Sebring 12 hours, the Jaguars were still way off the pace, the fastest Jag over 2.5 seconds off the GT pole sitter. Then when it came to the race, whilst there was a distinct improvement over last year, i.e. they completed more than 11 laps, the 98 got into a coming together with one of the BMWs that was making its way back through the field, which gave that car a penalty, along with the slightly tape ridden front end, which in turn caused issues later in the race. Then the BMWs exacted some unintended revenge on the 98, setting that for a spin. That car ended up 13th in class. 56 laps down on the GT winner. Whilst for the 99 car, well, a problem which I can't seem to find anywhere what the issue was, meant that they only completed 35 laps in the race. Like I said earlier, an improvement, still not great though. On to Long Beach. Some promise in qualifying, the 99 XKR of Demata and Junkera finished just under 2 seconds off the GT full time, and they would get to finish the race 6th in class albeit two laps down on the GT winner. Meanwhile, the 98 car, driven by PJ Jones and Paul Gentilosi, this race would end on lap two in an off-camera crash for Gentilosi. At Lime Rock, the Jaguars were still off the pace in qualifying trim, along with having problems such as misfires in some of the other sessions. However, when it came to the race, there was a lot of optimism. In race pace, the car could just about keep up with the other GT cars, going around 30 laps with their competitors not heading that far out into the distance, comparatively. If you know how this story has gone so far though, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that even this race didn't have a happy conclusion. The 98 car PJ Jones and Rocky Moran Jr got involved in an accident with a GT Challenge Porsche, with the damage putting it out of the race, whilst the 99 car of Demata and Junqueira was going along pretty nicely, until an electrical issue brought that car to a halt. After this round, Demata hasn't competed in a motor race since then. Mossport was next, with the fastest Jaguar 2.219 seconds off the GT pole time. 
Once again though, there was some promise. The 99 car driven by Kenny Wilden and Bruno Junquera showed some fantastic speed in the race, with Junquera getting into the top 10 in class, and setting a very similar pace to the other GT cars. Junquera said after the race, The car was real good today. Our Dunlop tyres were fantastic today, consistent and fast for the entire stint. Obviously good enough to help us achieve the fastest race lap. Yes, you heard that right! The Jaguar did set the fastest GT lap time of the race, a 118.102. They'd finally turned a corner, although I have so far neglected to tell you that this is what the car looked like early in the race. A split oil line cost the 99 car around 30 minutes, well out of contention for what could have easily been the car's best result. Other than leading the field to a restart, the 98 Jaguar of Jones and Moran Jr. didn't have as exciting of a race, with a late puncture not helping its cause. For qualifying at Mid-Ohio, the story was, well, perhaps somewhat familiar. Whilst in the race, both cars were able to keep some of the Privateer GT entries honest, although the 99 did end up getting into a coming together for the GT Challenge Porsche, then was on the receiving end themselves, just as they were about to serve the penalty they got for the initial contact. Both Jaguars finished outside the top 10 in class, four laps down. At Road America, the team had possibly its best qualifying result yet, on the longest track of the schedule, the fastest Jaguar was only, and I mean this comparatively speaking, 1.365 seconds off the GT pole time, 8th in the GT class. All that hard work though, was for nothing as the car severed an issue on the start finish straight before the race even began. Despite it getting the wave around and rejoining the lead lap, it wouldn't get beyond lap 9, whilst the 98 car lost several laps after its boot was lifted with the team having an issue. A disappointing end to a race with much promise. Baltimore was to follow with a similar story in qualifying. The 99 car dropped out of the race before it even started, for a reason which I can't find any information for anywhere, whilst the one car which did start, the 98 of Jones and Moran Jr, got involved in a pileup at the start. And although the car doesn't look all that badly damaged, the radiator and water lines were smashed, which meant the car retired on lap 1. Let's move on swiftly to Laguna Seca, where I've run out of phrases to summarise the Jaguar's usual lack of single lap pace, with it being over 2 seconds off the GT pole. The 98 car retired from contact in an off-camera collision, resulting in suspension damage, whilst the 99 XKR GT2 was involved in an incident that also wasn't shown, but they were seemingly an innocent party with nowhere to go other than the back of a Corvette, leading them to having to replace the nose, radiator, water lines, steering linkage and oil coolers. A spin later on would add to the misery. The season would be rounded off at the Petit Le Mans, with the fastest Jag 2.297 seconds off the GT pole. In the race, the 98 Jagger of Jones, Moran Jr and Shane Lewis lasted 26 laps until it ran over some debris, which went through the floor and got stuck in the firewall. That then broke some oil and electrical lines, which set the car on fire, and thus out of the race. Meanwhile, the 99 Junquera, Wilden and Ian James had low fuel pressure readings on the telemetry. When it entered the pits, the car also caught fire from a fuel issue, which in turn damaged the engine. Whilst they did get the car going, they decided to retire the XKR GT2 at the halfway point, having completed just 92 laps. Paul Gentilosi said of 2011, We have come a long way this season to giving the XKR on-track credibility, in our first full season with two cars. He also alluded to facts such as, race lap times well in advance of 2010, our qualifying time by over 2 seconds, and running 4th in the most competitive GT field this season. And of the 2012 prospects, we take these gains to the off season and will be working very hard for a strong championship run in 2012. However, when the 63 cars arrived at Sebring for the start of a new season, less than a month prior, it was announced that Jaguar had pulled the plug on the programme. The statement included the following. As Jaguar focuses all of its efforts on its ambitious global production growth plan, every aspect of Jaguar cars is committed to its global growth plan, meaning prudent and frequently difficult business decisions are being made along the way. The energy, focus and sheer determination within the RSR team are all virtues Jaguar has been proud to have been associated with. Clearly, despite all the effort, it couldn't be guaranteed that the car would be up with its GT competitors with Jaguar seemingly deciding it couldn't go on for another year with potentially 2010 and 2011 copy and pasted for another brand damaging season. So that was that, the end of what was an incredibly painful few years for the team, J 
Jaguar fans and Jaguar as a brand. To be honest, as much as it pains me to say this as well, it seems like one of the worst manufacturer-backed racing efforts of the 21st century. Or was it? Now this is where I start to get confused, because I'm wondering whether this was a manufacturer-backed effort in any way at all from a technical side, or whether this was just an RSI racing effort, with Jaguar just using it as marketing. Despite me doing research on this video for just under a month, I'm still none the wiser. Because I said earlier on in this video that when this effort was announced, it was stated that Jaguar would enter into a technical and marketing partnership with RSR Racing, with the British brand giving engineering support to the team. That would indicate a factory effort. However, John Hindoff said in one of the broadcasts in the 2011 season, when you're up against the might of the big factories like Ferrari and Porsche and BMW, then the manufacturer has to get involved, and you know Jaguar need to make a decision about whether they want to back this car. For the moment, this is the racing Jaguar, and somebody at Coventry has got to decide whether they want to back it or not. So what was it then? Were they involved, or were they not? If they weren't, I can only imagine what this car would have been like with proper manufacturer backing. That's not to discredit what the RSR team were trying to do in the first place, the car had been worked on several times with regular updates to the car, which did towards the end of the XKR GT2 stint, did show signs of improvement. The car was put through a wind tunnel, so clearly the team were committed to it, unless the wind tunnel was a shed with a bladeless fan in front of it, which I can't imagine was the case. In theory, a lot of ingredients were there to demonstrate that this car could work. A reasonably similar body style to the BMW M3 Coupe GT2, a front engine rear wheel drive layout, plus a shape which proved to be the fastest in speed traps in 2011. For whatever reason though, this car was never really on pace with its rivals, and that's not even including the countless mechanical gremlins this car was constantly played by. It's even more of a pity when you consider how Jaguar were seemingly all-in marketing-wise, with the brand also sponsoring certain TV elements, via brake bumpers and helicopter shots, as well as providing the pace car and billboard signage for the Sebring 12 hours. It's just such a massive shame. The RSR racing team continued until the end of 2015, fielding a car in the LMPC class. Before I finally get to my conclusion, it would be wrong of me not to mention a very ironic thing that happened whilst I was making this video. The car that raced at Le Mans was on sale as of six days ago when I'm doing this voiceover. It is now sold, however the car is one that is able to compete in Masters Endurance Legends events. Could we see this car return to the racetrack? I desperately hope so, because even though this was nothing other than an unmitigated disaster against its competitors and well and truly is an era of Jaguar's proud racing history that within the company they want to understandably bypass, this car still has a certain quirkiness to it. An underdog-like status, a team and car combination that people always rooted for. Plus the team demonstrated their commitment to this car, always working exceptionally hard, which sadly, because of the car's trials and tribulations, meant they were working extremely hard most of the time. Ultimately though, if we boil down to it, this big cat's racing tenure at the top of sports car racing very quickly became extinct. That though is going to be it for this video, thank you ever so much for watching, I certainly hope you enjoyed it. What did you make of this project? Would you have loved to have seen this car carry on its development? Or do you think it was destined to fail from the very beginning? Plus, on the off chance that somebody who was associated with the effort is watching this video, what was it like working on the project? Say in the comment section down below. Also, I don't usually say this because I find it uncomfortable plugging about myself and my channel, however, if you did enjoy this video, then I'd be extremely appreciative if you click the like and subscribe button. With all that being said though, until the next video, enjoy! the rest of your day.